my lowest point in this moment, and I almost went back home uh, after this happened to me. I, I saw a couple that were walking along Leicester Square, and I jumped in front of them because this is what they taught you to do. You've got to jump in front of people, get their attention. I jumped in front of the guy and I said, oh, it looks like you guys are having a great date. I can get you into, uh, you know, this theater production for half price. And the guy just looked at me and, and uh, kicked me right in the, uh, the, oh. the crown jewels. Wow. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> just, dropped, just dropped me. Just dropped me in the middle of the street. Just went plonk. Wow. Took me out and just stepped over my body. Welcome back to the show. There's no telling where we'll go. So come and share a laugh on the Imp and Skiz podcast. All right, we are back here again with our buddy Ren from Hermit Craft. How you doing, Ren? Part two. Part the two. Part. Did you have a good a good walk about? You get re-energized. Yep. I got a cup of tea because we're in tea. England, so we obviously have a cup of tea. Yeah. Which in is something England. that I didn't drink until I came to England. There you go. See, we're already starting off learning more about you because we didn't really talk about yeah. that. Uh, so you're currently living in England, as you just mentioned, but you're not initially from there, right? No, no. Look, if we're going to get personal this <laughs> part, there's a couple of <laughs> things I'd like to address with the audience. Okay. Because okay. these are questions that I always get whenever my face is on a camera somewhere. <laughs> uh, number one, I do have eyebrows. <laughs> I know it looks like I don't. But they're there, okay? <laughs> they're just very fine. Okay. And they're, I only have half eyebrows for some reason. It's genetics. <laughs> okay. okay? Fair uh, enough. This is, this is not um, dirt. People often think this is dirt on my face. But these are actually uh, moles on my face. <laughs> it's not dirt. <laughs> and I have eyebrows. Okay. Now that we've got that out of the way. Now that we got that out of the way. I... I I didn't have, I didn't even, I mean, you look like you have eyebrows to me. I don't know what we're dealing with here, but that's all right. Whenever I've been on uh, on camera and anything, I, the question always comes up, why does Ren not have eyebrows? So I'm just dealing with it now, okay? <laughs> there we go. The I love that. So where did you um, grow up? Where, where, tell us about young, young Ren, if you would. So um, I was born in South Africa, and... That is at the very end of the African continent. I know that might, might sound stupid, but I have met people who don't know where South Africa is, and that's totally fine. Like, uh, it's interesting that when you live somewhere strange, strange, that isn't the US or Europe or, you know, Australia or somewhere obvious, you just assume that everybody knows where you're from or that mm. everybody knows where your country is, right? Yeah. Um, and I've made many, it's definitely a mistake that I've made as an immigrant many, many times, just assuming people know what South Africa is. And, uh, you know, assuming people know who Nelson Mandela is, for example, um, uh, who was a very important uh, figure in South Africa. Um, but, you know, obviously not everybody does. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just like I couldn't name all the US states, you know, you guys probably uh, don't know too much about South Africa either. But anyway, South Africa is all the way at the end of the African continent. It was a, it, it is a very important country, but it was an important country for history because it essentially became the connecting point between Europe and India. And Cape Town is the furthest most city in South Africa. And essentially during the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, England and Holland were going along at, all the way down Africa, stopping in South Africa, and then going all the way back to India to get spice. And of course, spice was a huge commodity back in these days, and they would bring it back uh, to Europe and then eventually to the Americas, of course. So South Africa was like a very important uh, position on the planet during this time. And it was battled over by the British and by the Dutch, and the French got involved a bit, and the Germans got involved a bit. So does that mean you have like more of a British ancestry then, than, than more of like a South African rooted an ancestry, because they were kind of like colonized, like you said? Yep. Well, my ancestry is actually more Dutch than, oh, than okay. British. But indeed, um, so my, both my mum and my father were from Dutch lineage, which is eventually what became a language called Afrikaans in South Africa, which is a language that I speak and my, my family speaks. But um, yeah, I grew up very much in a, a European or British or even American, I would say, type of um, like household and culture and whatever, right? Like we, we watched uh, US tv and uk tv you know I, I had cartoon network like mtv which is what got me into like metal and rock music you know mtv2 those late night shows 
where you would just see that soil video about 3,000 times. I don't know if you remember this. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, South Africa was, uh, was I, I grew up there as in a, in a very like um, secluded bubble, should I say. Like I could have been in England or I could have been in America um, because that was the media that we were consuming. That, you know, we didn't really have our own, uh, our own stuff. We were consuming U.S. And, and U.K. media. But, you know, South Africa at the time when, when I was there was just coming out of apartheid, which was a, a very uh, rough time in the history of South Africa. And um, people will know Nelson Mandela or they might not know Mel Nelson Mandela, I just assume. Um, but Mandela sort of uh, brought the country into like a new era where we said goodbye to a lot of really terrible stuff that was happening. And we we ushered in a new a new time for for us all there. Um, and this happened, you know, I was, I was too young to be a part of any of that, but, um, I was certainly in South Africa during the time where things were changing during the times of change, which was really great. The thing is, I was so young that I didn't even know that it was happening. Right. Like I was mm -hmm. a teenager, so I, I knew nothing about the, the history or what was going on or, or anything. What I did know is that MTV was awesome <laughs> and that, um, overseas, this thing called the internet was happening, right? <laughs> oh, and wow. uh, when I was, you know, in my late teens, obviously, you know, South Africa had internet too, but we, our internet was very slow and the rest of the world was kind of catching up or uh, not even catching up, it was hyper speeding into the internet era. And when I was 18 or 19 and, and going to university, um, I really wanted to be a part of that huge thing you know i wanted to be a part of the internet age i i something in me just knew this was going to be huge you know i'd been playing video games my whole life um and i i, I started playing starcraft on battle.net like for many years uh at school and i just i wanted more i wanted it all i wanted the internet i wanted like all the technology everything and in order to do that, I needed to to uh, to leave uh, South Africa because it, uh, South Africa is it was just taking too long for sure. uh, the internet to catch up there, you know. But you did go and, to uh, university that... in in South Africa. I did, yeah, okay. I did, I did. I I went to a boarding school also. So um, <laughs> so most of my younger years was was actually spent trying to um, woo the ladies. Because I, sp I See, spent I, my team. I'm getting a common theme around. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I, I every time he says this, I I, I think back to um, Hermit Gang, the the rap song, and he's like, "Ladies, get in line." You know, <laughs> yeah. Like that's one of his yeah. his lyrics in that song. <laughs> So now you it's know, all starting it's, to come together. I see it's this. all coming together. Yeah. You know, it's all coming together. You know, I in the last part, I I, I uh, spoke about that book that I wrote for a lady that didn't uh, equate to anything. <laughs> Unfortunately, at university, I um, I wrote some poems, as I told you, for the ladies. That never equated to anything. At one point, when I was on the radio there, I uh, I thought that that might be a good way to uh, woo a very pretty girl that I was interested in there, and I invited her to the studio, you know, uh, to come and 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 watch a show, you know, flex. come and watch me in action, mm -hmm. you know, a little flex action going on. <laughs> Unfortunately, the, show, the the day before. Um, I had decided to do a bit of a Howard Stern thing where I barbecued in the studio. Um, <laughs> it was a whole thing. I put like uh, plastic bags over the microphones and put the the mics on the steaks, like on the the in the barbecue. <laughs> I mean, it was ridiculous. We smoked out the whole building, set the fire alarms oh. off. It was a great show, <laughs> but the place stunk like barbecued fat, you know. So this poor girl like came into the studio and, and it was just a complete disaster. <laughs> um, but yes, anyway, most of the things that I've done in my life has been to try, try and impress the ladies. Unfortunately, still just just little old me. So it obviously hasn't worked all these years. You hate to see it, really. <laughs> oh, man. So so you make the move to uh, to England. And uh, I, I, I'm just curious, like trying to juxtapose life in South Africa versus life in in England, Were, was there was there some kind of any kind of cultural shocks for you when you arrived in England and started settling down that, that you're like, whoa, this is completely different than the way I grew up or maybe the food I ate and things like that. I mean, what was the, what yeah. was like the biggest change for you when, in, during that move? Well, I think my, my life in South Africa, I mean, I was extremely uh, lucky to have been brought up in a in a very successful household. Both my parents worked extremely hard and and uh, 
gave us a really privileged life. Um, all the way up until I left South Africa, I never wanted for anything. Um, you know, I had such a such a fantastic education and university that my parents provided for me. Um, and of course, at the time, it was just completely normal to me. You know, I didn't I didn't realize that in other parts of the world, um, you know, life can be quite difficult. And it's it's quite difficult. You know, you, you only see these things once you experience them. And so one of the the biggest shocks that I had, for example, was coming to England and realizing that, um, man, the, the world is kind of rough. <laughs> yeah. It's quite unforgiving. You know, there's in South Africa, if, uh, because I lived it after I finished university, I did live in South Africa for a few years before I came over uh, to England. But there were times in those early years where I ran out of money and, you know, a quick phone call to mom. Oh, mom, you know, having a tough time you know, yeah. <laughs> please help. And of course, parents are always going to help, right? So, so you know, mum always made sure that I was okay if I, if I ran out of money or whatever. But when I came to England, especially in those days, there was no PayPal or anything like this. It, it wasn't really possible to get money from South Africa in particular to, to England. So I very quickly realized that the world is pretty, is pretty rough. And if you want to succeed, you have to, uh, Put your foot you know you have to put your foot down and get it done like you can't mess around uh, th there's a there's a lot of unforgivingness about the world and you need to do if you want something you got to go for it it's not going to come to you you know uh, so i went to england i sold all my stuff in south africa i sold my car and all my things and i, pr I probably went over with two two and a half thousand dollars or something like this right just nothing oh i had all my magic cards though and my guitar and like that was it <laughs> and like some cash and i slept on my ex-girlfriend's floor she was my my girlfriend back in South Africa, and then she she went to England, and then I went a few years later. So I stayed on her floor for the first <laughs> uh, six months that I was there, and uh, I very quickly realized that I was just another Joe in the big city. Yeah, you know, yeah. In South Africa, I was more because uh, um, I was highly educated, and it was easier for me to find a place in South Africa, but. In England, I was just another qualified person, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like all the other people were just as good as I was. And I was really struggling to find work. I mean, my first jobs involved selling tickets in Leicester Square, which is the center of London. And it was a commission-based gig. So if you were in London as a tourist, I would spot you. I would come up to you and be like, hey, Impulse, I'll give you these tickets to Les Miserables theater production. And you'll get a meal at the steak joint next to it you know and i'll take 10 percent off and you know it's 200 dollars. um that's what i was doing and you would only get paid if you sold the tickets you'd only get commission right and uh my lowest point in this moment and i almost went back home uh, after this happened to me i i saw a couple that were walking along leicester square and i jumped in front of them because this is what they taught you to do you got to jump in front of people get their attention i jumped in front of the guy and i said oh it looks like you guys are having a great date I can get you into, uh, you know, this theater production for half price. And the guy just looked at me and, and uh, kicked me right in the, uh, the, oh. the crown jewels. Wow. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> just, dropped, just dropped me. Just dropped me in the middle of the street. Just went plonk. Wow. Took me out. And just stepped over my body with the girl and uh, carried on walking. That's an, oh, that's an overreaction. <laughs> I mean... You know, I, I jumped in front of him. That's I interrupted rough. his date. I mean, you know, well, probably shouldn't have no assaulted have me, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was a pretty, that was an all time, one of the all time lows, definitely. But um, it was these sort of moments where I realized like, okay, the real world is, is pretty scary and you need to, uh, you need to, you need to be made of like tough stuff to make it out here, you know, in these, in these cities like London and New York and these sort of places. Um, You've, you've got to uh, you've got to be made of stern human material yeah. to survive mm -hmm. you know yep have you yep. have you been to new york by chance i have yes my brother Jono studied at uh, at berkeley in boston so i, I was lucky enough to go over a, a couple of times okay new york was something that was whew, that reminded me again that i was just a tiny little ant oh new york, yeah <laughs> on specifically, this planet specifically new york city will do that to you to where when you're in New York City, the only way you can see the sky is if you look straight up. There's no horizon yep. sky because you're like you're basically a tiny ant inside a, a, a playset. And and it's it's just you feel so dwarfed and so swallowed up by the city. 
And I, I'll be honest with you, as fascinating as New York City can be, I don't like it. I, 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 I am very, I have an aversion to that type of energy. And mm -hmm. people, some people love the hustle and the bustle. And they like the mm -hmm. fact that I remember I was there because I had to go there a, a few times for my daughter's softball. And I remember I was in the city and I was with a crew of people and they, we wanted to get some Chinese food. And, and I love Chinese food. And we went to this Chinese food restaurant that was, you had to go down a flight of stairs to get to. We waited in line, which was on the stairs for like 45 minutes. Jeez. And when we finally got in, I'm not joking when I say my, my elbows were touching other patrons. Like it was like, it was, <laughs> you were crammed in there and the food was, yep. the food was good. But I remember thinking, this is not, this is memorable, but not in a good way. All this right. experience sucks. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't like it. No, it's tough. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, like, you know, it, there were a lot of things that that were amazing to me. The, the, this is one of the great things about coming from a place like South Africa to the first world, right? I mean, South Africa is by no means a third world country or it's if you go there to Johannesburg or Cape Town or Durban, all these cities, it will feel very modern to you. But outside of the cities, it's a lot more rural and, and not as modern, you know? Yeah. Um, but for example, when I got to London, I landed at Heathrow, which was the biggest airport that I'd ever seen in my life. This was the first time I'd, <laughs> I'd flown out of South Africa, really. And um, it was amazing to me that I could get on a tube on a subway that would take me straight into the center of town, underground, under the city, through these tunnels. Yep. It had like these super fancy sliding doors and air conditioning and all this crazy stuff. For me, th this was like the future, you know? I couldn't believe it. <laughs> it, was, it was so amazing. Um, and you know, London and, uh, in particular is, is a, a fascinating and amazing city because it just, and that's the one thing that I love about the British, everything on this island just works. Everything just works. It's so great. <laughs> like the buses in London, there, if you live in London, there's a saying that a Londoner will say, you can get anywhere in London in under an hour. And this is true. Anywhere in the entire city, the buses are perfect. Like the tube system is perfect. Everything is just, it's so awesome. Um, but it was also very, very, intense yeah <laughs> yeah you know very intense yeah, yeah i went to uh london a few years back with tango and we hung out with with zedef and he was our tour guide uh since nice. he's from the area and it, it was wild you know the the uh the mind of the gap announcements as you're getting mind of the gap. Uh, uh, yeah on the on the what do you call it? the the tube we call it a subway the tube, over yeah. here yeah. um but yep. yeah it, it's a real experience and and it was i mean it's a lot of people and in hustle and bustle kind of feeling i haven't been to new york but i can imagine uh it, it might even be more in new york than than in london and uh but more so it was just like the history you know seeing Big Ben mm. and and walking these streets that like over here uh, that we see a lot of times in cinema, right? Uh, and yep. and so like it was it was a surreal experience. My wife has not forgiven me for not taking her, uh, but mm. we went for we went for a Minecon. Uh, they had a, a Minecon there in London. I can't remember what year it was. Maybe 2015, 2014, um, and and it was a great time. It was a, such a cool place to be. I could yeah. definitely see what the draw would be, and I could also see. How coming from you know a smaller city that could be like very overwhelming, almost like uh, sensory overload yeah. in a way. You know, yeah, like. And, yeah. But the one thing that blew me away, I remember this, was the bicyclists. I don't know how yes. how any of them survive. <laughs> they, they are absolutely like weaving in and out of crazy traffic. Yeah. I mean, in the buses he's yep. talking about, they're the double decker buses that you see in like Harry Potter. You know, yep. like yep, <laughs> yep, yep. And it's not just one of them every five minutes. Yeah. There's like thousands of those buses all over the place. It's, yeah. it's mad. It was such no, a, and, and, such and a cool place. I, I hear what you're saying about the. That's one of the things I loved most about it was the age of the stuff because I think South Africa is similar to the U.S. where we're kind of new, you know. Um, the U.S. has been around since, what, 1650 or something, S somewhere around here. South Africa was also similar times. And we, we didn't have enough time to, like, build castles and build these, <laughs> like, these awesome things that have survived for yeah. thousands of years. Yeah. Yep. We're very, um, we're very young. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Whereas in England or you in London and you can go see something that is, you know, ridiculously old. That's three or four times older than our entire countries. And yeah. uh, this is... This, it's fascinating when yeah. you see it for the first time. You know, it's it's really really cool. When I yeah. went to Ireland, I was in Ireland for like a week for work, and um, I had to learn how to use the train station and everything, and which is sort of their version of a subway, if you will. And when I got on the train, because I had to take the train from my hotel, which was in Dublin, 
uh, over to my my workplace, which was in Leaslip. And the train, I remember thinking, I don't want to take a train. And so I get on this train. The reason I did not want to get on the train is because I thought it was going to be like a subway. And if you're listening to this and you live in New York, I'm not insulting you or your area, but the subways are disgusting. <laughs> and it's, it's, it, is un, and it, it is like you, when you're there, keep your hand on your possessions. You never know what's coming. Like it is a terrible anxiety ridden experience. But I go to Ireland, I get on this train and I walk in. It's not just like these dingy seats or whatever. It's like tables on the train. Yep. Tables, wi amazing Wi-Fi. Plugs. Yeah. I, I, I opened up my laptop. <laughs> yeah. I started working. It was the most beautiful draw. Like the 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 uh the the view was amazing. The people were so lovely. It was clean AC, like you said. And I was like, I, I don't I don't want to go back to home right now. This is where I want to live. It was just amazing. So I, yeah. I I get it. Yeah. That's fantastic. But you know, it's so interesting uh being an immigrant because it's certainly um and it, it's certainly a very difficult thing to do. And I often get asked in streams about, from young people, they, they will often ask me, um, can you give, I, I'm thinking about immigrating, can you give me some advice? And my advice is always to not immigrate unless you really want to or really have to. Because immigration is a extremely difficult thing for very many reasons. And you, you it, it takes many, many years to realize all of these things, you know? Um, but certainly one of the, the the most difficult things about it is that you suddenly realize that you are only ever home when you are home. And home, I think, is where you were born and where your family is and where you were brought up. Mm. And as much as you want somewhere else to be home, it never will be. And I... I'm still trying to figure out why this is, and maybe it's just unique to me, but I certainly have never uh, spoken to an immigrant who has said differently. Uh, I think it's probably very rooted in uh, our development stages as children, where we probably create such an intense uh, bond to our environment and the people around it and our culture and our accents and all of these things that you never quite, you can never undo it, right? It's a part of, of who you are. Um, and so with immigration comes like a, quite a lot of, of, of tr trying to fit in, but never really getting there, you know? Mm. That's kind of what it feels like. You're always trying to fit in. You always almost get there, but you never quite get there. And it's so funny because when you go home, you're instantly home, you know? Yeah. Doesn't matter, you could be away for years. <laughs> and then you go back and you just, your, your, your yeah. soul is at ease instantly. Yeah. Um, all the sights, sounds, yeah. smells, it all comes back, you know, the all of these things. Yeah. You remember yeah. as a child now. Okay. So you've been in England for how long now? Uh, I've kind of lost count at this point, uh, <laughs> probably 13 or 14 years or something like that. Okay. Yeah. So you've Maybe been after more. that long. It's still not exactly yeah. feeling like home for you and, and of your family. Were you the only one that moved to England? I was, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it's interesting. I I moved to England. My a brother of mine went to Canada. Another brother, uh, John, and my brother went to Los Angeles, <laughs> and my parents stayed in in South Africa. So the family very much um, shattered, I suppose. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, this is another one of those things, really, that that makes immigration quite difficult because to a lot of people, and you know, I've I've spoken about this a lot on my stream because people ask me a lot about this. Um, to a lot of people, family and being with family is, is so normal, right? It's your whole life. Like you're close to your family, you're close to your parents. Uh, you might move a few hours away or to another part of the city, but generally people's families stick together quite a lot, right? But with families of immigrants, it's different. Like immigrant families like shatter, you know, they, they fly all over the, the world <laughs> and they're still families and it's, you know, we can talk to each other uh, on Skype. I phone my mom every week, uh, every weekend, and phone my dad every weekend. But you know, it's not it's not the same as having dinner with your family or even just popping over to give your mum a hug or whatever. Like you, you don't get to do these things anymore. But and and this is why I give the advice that you know, if you are thinking about immigrating, really think about it, because basically what happens is you desensitize yourself to these realities, mm. right? Because they're so tough and because it's so painful you must 
kind of forget that it's this that that it is this way, you know? Because if you start focusing in on the reality that I've been away from my family for 15 years, it starts to I can already feel like the tweak, you know? Mm -hmm. Like it starts to get you. So you just take that that and you put it in a box and then you just forget about it. Like that's what you have to do, you know? And I think that this whole experience of immigrating has definitely made me into a very hard individual and um i i know that i i definitely like bump heads with people a lot because because of this hardness but it is a it is a hardness that protects me right like it's it's a self-made hardness that keeps me from exploding <laughs> mm. keeps all my bits together you know um and uh, and so you know this these are the sort of things that you i i think when you're young and you're thinking about immigrating you don't think about you know, you're just like, oh, I want to go to go to yeah. go somewhere else. It's so exciting and so awesome. But I think that if I if I did it all again, I would definitely have thought about it a lot more, and uh, would have perhaps been a little bit more hesitant about it because it does make you into a very, well, it can make you into a very hard person, uh, and and perhaps you lose a little bit of your soft edges because of it. You know, I think I used to be a little bit more fluffy. <laughs> in, in my younger yeah. years yeah. and i've hard i've i've hardened up i've i've I turned into a bit of uh, beef jerky over these the, all these years uh, you know? i don't know man i mean like there is still obviously a, a soft uh, part of you because that does sound very almost i don't know if narcissistic is the right word but like when you say hard you, you think of somebody that's that's not caring, you know, in a way like people. Yeah, will sure. That. It's probably the, and, yeah, and the wrong And that's definitely not you. I, <laughs> yeah. I know from your history and uh, and your interactions with people, uh, how much you care for others and the well-being of others to a point to where you will put uh, other people over your your own uh, self. Uh, one thing that comes to mind it was uh, a clip that's out there of you streaming one day when. Mr. Beast decided to donate what a thousand dollars or something to you, and what was your yeah, reaction was to to receiving this this money that was gifted to you from the famous Mr. Beast? Do you remember? Uh, I don't remember. I'm gonna tell you because I, I I remember it fondly. You you said thank you very much. Um, I but I personally don't actually need this money. I'm going to uh, donate it to somebody that does. That was your reaction to receiving a, such a large sum of money from Mr. Beast. Was you you immediately felt like you didn't need it personally yourself at the time? For you must you know must have been doing okay, and you wanted to uh, like pass it on. And and I was like, wow, I was blown away by that because it really did speak volumes yeah. of uh, you as a person and you knowing okay, I'm good, but I know there's other people out there that aren't good. And I want to help them in any way I can. So uh, I just, yeah, I just wanted to bring that up because it was starting to sound it's like, a, well, it's a cool you know, story too, but, yeah. but you're right. It's like, he's saying like he, I'm with you on that. When he said hard, I'm like, no, you yeah. know, right? <laughs> and now, now we have to entertain that. There's a part of, of Ren that we don't know. We have to entertain that. We are, we're very familiar with him. We get to work with them and, and I want to dive more into that too, but we have to entertain that there might be a side to Ren that we don't fully know or that he has not shown of us course. or whatever. Yeah. But in terms of what, like my definition of what uh, like hard is or whatever, I do, I, t I tend to think of a cold, callous, right. uncaring person and you're the furthest thing from it. So, uh, but, but, but in order to, you, you did what you're explaining to me is that you did develop or you start your, your, your defense mechanism started to show itself. Whereas you were very, you're much more vulnerable before and then you went into this new land and the land quite literally kicked you in the nuts yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah yep, yep, exactly. you had to uh exactly you had to sort of preemptively strike after that so it sounds like you just yeah you just got you just kind of evolved into something i, I guess it's a order. yeah it's it's probably the wrong word to use you know I, I i suppose uh i i guess what i'm trying to say is that i i i'm not affected by small things as much as a oh. as as someone else might be that's, yeah. right that's good yeah. like it <laughs> thick, takes it takes skin, a lot to kinda, you know. yeah thick skin i guess is maybe a better way to put it you know um it it, it certainly takes a lot to you know to really uh to really get to me or, or or impact me and i think uh that's probably why i i mean you know it, it's it's always a bit awkward to hear all these things are you know you care so much about other people and stuff because uh um, I, I think that is that it is just a natural response to 
me um, just being on my own so much. You know, I, I live a very solitary life. So I've looked after myself. Like it's easy to look after one person, right? I, I got myself covered. So it do, for me, it doesn't make sense to then just keep looking after myself. I mean, there's only so much self, you know, care I can give. And the next natural uh, reaction for me is to is to try and help out uh, in, in, elsewhere as much as I can. Um, I think it it's it also helps me to to feel like uh, what I'm doing has some sort of purpose, right? And I think that's what we all look for in life is is a reason for for doing whatever we're doing. And um, I think we're, we're you know people can be quite harsh on themselves because that's just how we are. Like we're much harsher on we're, we're much harsher with each other than we are with others. You know the way that I speak to myself sometimes I would never speak this way to another person and I, and I think we can probably all yeah, <laughs> all relate to this um, and and I think I try and combat this by uh, by helping others and 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 seeing them you know achieve something out of this this help uh, I think is a very is very rewarding for someone that um, is a very very solitary person you know I think it's 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 a result of being solitary dude. Let me tell you something, Ren, and anybody listening, <clears throat> you are quite literally, probably unknowingly right now, illustrating what I'm doing this season in, in Hermitcraft. It's I'm making, <laughs> I'm constructing Maslow's pyramid and it's a, it's a hierarchy of needs. And the top one is self-actualization. And one of the key components of being self-actualized is the awareness that the self has been managed. The self has been taken care of, right? You have your food, you have your security, you have your esteem, you have your belonging, you have all that stuff. And now it's time for service. And that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Like quite literally, as soon as the self has been actualized, the self has been realized and fits, and you've realized like you've gotten to the pinnacle of what you're here to do, then you move into this realm of service. And it's mm -hmm. interesting to me because I, it, I, I always felt pretty familiar um, with Maslow's Pyramid, but in order to, to do it the justice that I want to do it this season, I, I started boning up on it, started reading more mm -hmm. on it and, and more. And that's when I learned even more that self-actualization was even more than I thought it was. And in, in my personal opinion, you're, you're showing signs of self-actualization. When you talk about that the self of Ren has been managed and has been taken care of, and now you look to service, that's 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 a form of self actualization that can be argued less than five percent of human population even gets to play in. This is very fascinating to me that when he said it's time I want it's I want to you know I want to help other people you know I'm taking care of or whatever I can manage one person. I don't think you're aware of how many people have a hard time managing the one person that is themselves. <laughs> so you've managed to manage the Ren so well. And then you actually uh, started to discuss what it is to do service. I was like, this is what I just read up on. He's literally talking about what mm -hmm. I just read up on. So this is, <laughs> this is a fun little full circle moment for you. <laughs> do you mind if we dive a little bit more into um, some of the philanthropy that you're doing? Um, of course. I, I know that uh, you have a charity that you've, done a lot for SOS South Africa. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and how that came to be? And, and some of the, I, I, I you know, I, I know it's hard to talk about yourself it, when you are being philanthropic. Uh, how do you say it? Uh, but I, it, yeah, but tell us, you've done I, a lot of good. I don't think with anyone has ever been able to say that word. No, properly, it's a tough so word. I think you're okay. Philanthropic. <laughs> 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 I don't know. It's um, yeah, so so a few years ago in season seven, uh, we did a really big a charity drive on stream for SOS Africa, which is a, a small charity based in in South Africa in Cape Town, and uh, it it was uh, an incredible incredible moment for for me in particular. And uh, you know, I want to say a big shout out to to Green and and Scar and B Dubs and everybody else who was involved because uh, we managed to raise enough money in that first uh, that first drive to look after. I mean, it was I can't even remember the numbers, but it was stupid numbers. This was during COVID, and that first drive was to was to generate food for. I mean, I I need to I need to see the numbers again, but they were massive, and you know, this was. In South Africa, you know, poverty in 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 the U.S. or in in the in in Europe is maybe not quite what poverty is in in Africa or in other places in the world. You know, uh, there's poverty and then there's poverty. Mm -hmm. There's poverty where 
you know, you got to, you know, you're struggling to find a place to live, but you can go get some food every morning at a soup kitchen and so on. But then there's poverty where you have no where to sleep and you have no help and you have no one. And that unfortunately is, is, um, is prevalent in South Africa. And the, the help that we did with that first drive provided food and medicine for, I mean, just so many people, it, it, it was actually insane. Um, and we probably, you know, inadvertently uh, helped to change the lives of a lot of people who were in desperate, desperate need during that time. Uh, but, you know, we were, we were doing it remotely, so it's really difficult to see the, the impacts. But SOS Africa were, were weekly posting pictures of truckloads of food that were going out to the, the rural sediments to, you know, to, to help feed people and so on. And it was a really, really a, a, a amazing, a, amazing time. Uh, we then did another drive, which is a more tangible result. And I'm very pleased to say that actually this year the project has been completed. And SOS uh, Africa's goal was to build a school in Cape Town to service one of the um, um, one of the, the 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 townships is what they're called. Uh, you know, these are sort of low income areas of a city. And this school has taken a very long time to to be built because there was some pushback from some of the the local residents in the area um, that didn't want the school to be built there. But after a long court battles and so on. Um, SOS Africa managed to get it done, and I think the school is opening this uh, this year. And I'm actually I might even be able to see it in April because I'm going to South Africa for my 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 dad's birthday. Um, but this is this is something, you know, it was amazing to be able to help tens of thousands of people during COVID. But now we have created uh, something that is going to help people, not only personally, but could potentially improve the country in many ways you know the school might have the next president going through it you know the school might have the next big uh south african bill gates go through it you know who knows what will come of this um and for me it's it's a small tiny little bucket in the ocean of what i feel i owe south africa you know i grew up in south africa as i've said in a very uh, in a very privileged way and the country gave me so much it gave me my education. It gave me my, it gave, you know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for South Africa. And I just kind of left, you know, I just packed up my bags and just left and took all of what the country gave me and didn't leave anything behind. And so these charity things that I've been doing is a, a very tiny way for me to, to give back to a country that gave me so much. And, um, you know, None of it I, I could have done without the hermits, of course. So, you know, uh, just, you know, huge shout out to, to Green and Scar and B-dubs and, and, and everybody who was a part of all of that. It was, it was really amazing. But, you know, it, like I say, it's just a small, a small tiny thing that I've done. And, you know, I want to try to do more to like give back to the country and, and, and you know, just, I, I guess just to say thanks for uh, making yeah. me who I was and, and not just taking from South Africa and never giving back again, you know? I don't know. You have a um you have a very refreshing connection to the earth. And I know that sounds weird, but I I think that there's a great many people that would pack up and leave and feel just fine with it. And I think yeah. I might be one of those people. I think that mm. if I I don't I don't know because I don't I have not gone through the chapter of 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 immigrating, but I think that if I were to, for some reason, would I have some sort of inclination to give back to the land I came from? I'd like to hope I would, but I don't know if I would. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing, I mean, you, he keeps using things like that's a tiny token of what you're, you're joking, right? You, mm -hmm. you built a school. Like you're like, this is huge. This is great. This is huge what, what you've done. Um, but I, this is a very refreshing connection to the, to the earth. I, this is, this is very fascinating. I'm enjoying listening to this, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, so that, South Africa is a very interesting place. I, I think it's, I hear what you're saying and, and, I, and I don't want anybody to feel bad, you know, about immigrating and, and then, you know, I don't want people to feel like they have to give back from where they come from. I guess South Africa is, it's kind of unique though, because, um, you know, I grew up with, with so much, right? But just across the road were people with nothing, right? And this... It's it's such a huge dichotomy in South Africa that um, 
for me, I felt like I, 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 I just had so much, I had such a privileged upbringing that I was compelled to try, you know, to make sure that I gave back. It was one of the things that I, I promised myself when I got on the plane. I was like, you know, I will give back in some way um, just because I was so lucky. I had so much, you know, unbelievable amounts compared to uh, your average South African. So, but, um, but yeah, um, so is that, <laughs> I, I never really thought about this. Is way, that yeah. charity still active? It is. Yep. 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 That's yep. Still going uh, today. Absolutely. All right. Well, yep. let's, let's pop that link in the description. Anybody oh, no. Oh, oh, do you mean the, the fundraising? No, the fundraising is, is currently closed, but, um, oh, oh, gotcha. the, okay. the, the, that project is now finishing up. We were waiting for that project to, to, to be finishing up. Gotcha. But, um, okay. Okay. It's, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful, uh, um, charity. And I know that a few hermits support it too. Um, I, I sponsor three kids through this charity too. I don't have children of my own. And, um, uh, when we started doing this work, Dr. Matt at the charity told me about the fact that you could you could sponsor children individually, and your sponsorship gives these kids food, clothing, uh, transport to and from school, um, even provides food for for the families for some of the, the the families that have very very little food. It'll actually provide food for the families at, at home, and uh, it's not you know it's it's not it's not. Uh, for us anyway, it's, it's not a ton of money, um, to be able to support a kid. So I've got three kids coming through school at the moment. I get their report cards every year or whatever, and they're all doing exceptionally well. And I am, um, I'm looking forward to meeting them and so on. And, um, and yeah, I mean, but look, it, all, these things are easy to do when you're single and you don't have children, right. And you, <laughs> all you do is make Minecraft videos. Like it's, it's easy to do these other things when there's there, there aren't other responsibilities it's also, on the, it's also easy on enough the cards. not to do it, it, it's easy <laughs> hold on hold on it's easier not to yeah and so uh, i mean that's it, it's fine i don't want to take away your freedom from for to be flippant about it but i know plenty of single dudes and giving to the level that you give giving to a tenth of the level you give is the furthest thing from their mind and I would venture that you are absolutely the minority here. I, I think that it's very rare yeah. to find somebody who uh, gives on this level, who who makes it part of their id. You know what I mean? Yeah. They don't do it in passing. They don't do it as an afterthought. They, they, they he Ren is leaning into this as part of what his entity is. And it I, just it just speaks volumes to who you are as a human big being, time, right? Yeah. When you see somebody um, being so generous uh, and and giving like that and that, i think that's why I, I wanted to bring it up because it it does feel when i think of you i think of a very um loving and giving human being and you know i i want our our, our listeners and our, our viewers to to get to know that part of you you know because when we're on camera we're we might not be that person right we're, you're you're goofy yeah. you're still red yeah, yeah, right yeah. but but you it, it that doesn't tell the story of who you are like that that story is not told in a minecraft video but here on a podcast we can we can dive in a little bit and get to know who you are you off camera can. right and that's mm -hmm. and i think that's important especially when we're talking about being more relatable as cre i was gonna say crazy art i'm gonna go i'm gonna go with artists no you <laughs> talked me into it nice uh, it's easy nice, to say nice, creator, nice. But like i'm gonna it. go with artists as as artists it's easy to um see people for what they are through their art and not understand who they actually are and I think telling these stories and, and, and getting uh, to people to see that the, the things that you're doing and the lives you're changing uh, and, and the different things that you're doing through your philanthropy is, is super important to understand what you are about, like who you are. And, mm -hmm. and that's why I wanted to dive into it. You know, we good. don't have to continue uh, digging and digging, but uh, I just think it, it does speak volumes. And, and that's something that I've always really admired about you and that's why you know i oh, was thanks, like guys. very humbled that you would come and give us uh your time to be on on the podcast today Can thanks guys we're gonna, we are going to change the subject though uh, yeah i want well you got something in mind because i have things i want to talk about you go go <laughs> ahead you go i want to go you go i want to go back to the first time i got to actually work with ren which was in the life series uh when when uh, well you and martin you, this is when i started to learn that uh, Ren's ability to to give into lore and and create mm -hmm. accents and create a character was um, indicative that there's more to Ren uh, than just playing the Minecraft game. Is that you actually enjoy putting on a costume? Did you do theater as a kid? River Park. I did. Yeah, I did. I did. Um, 
I, it, it was the build up to me wanting to be in a band, you know, the, the first things that I did, <laughs> the first thing I did was theater. I was always in the plays. Uh, I was, you know, I always, uh, auditioned for the main roles and so on. I, I always just, I was a little showman kid, you know, I just wanted to be front and center all the time, which is ironic because it's, it's kind of juxtaposed to my actual personality, which is, I don't want, I want as few human beings around me as possible in, yeah. in IRL. Yep. But I want to show off all the time. So yep. I don't know. I'm a mess, I guess. No, in this well, then, then I'm a mess too, bro. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wanted to be, yeah. I, wanted the, I wanted the lead role. I did theater too. I wanted the lead role. I wanted all the attention. But when the play was over, yep. I just wanted to be by myself. <laughs> yep, know? yep, yep. But um, yeah, what, one, of my, one of my favorite moments that happened in theater, I, I was in my final year of school. I, I'm not sure. I, in the US, is it college? Is that your last year yeah. of school when you're 17, 18? Is that it? That's in high school. We we finish off. Is that uh, high school? Yeah, high school, and then we go to after we graduate high school, we go to college. What we call college, and I think in in England they call it university. Same thing. Right, right, right. Okay, so this is my last year of high school. I was seventeen, um, and I went to a boarding school. And in this boarding school, there were seven. Um, we called them houses. Very much like Harry Potter, actually. You know, like Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, <laughs> these things. The real thing, huh? No, I mean, cra crazy. My school was basically, it was basically Harry Potter because it was a British boarding school. <laughs> like, basically Harry Potter. Um, and every year at the school, each house would have to put on a play. And uh, the theater teacher would judge the best play, right? It was just like a little competition that we had um, in the humanities department. So in my final year, I said to my... Uh, I said to the theater teacher, look, I want to write the play and direct wow. it, right? Let me write the play and direct Because usually they, we would just do a play that had been written already. Short plays, right? 20 minutes, like nothing, no Shakespeare or anything like that. So she said, okay, do you think you can do it? And I said, I, pro I have no idea. Let me try. I'll try and write this play. So I wrote this play and uh, I arranged for all the actors to come to the, the like the amphitheater every night and we rehearsed and we got the play done and we put the play on and, and I put myself in the play right at the end. And, um, I was, a the play was about a, a school and I was the janitor janitor in the school. And at the very end of the play, I, I come onto the stage sweeping, right? Like sweeping after the kids, the kids like make a big mess. And then I come and sweep all their, their packets and, pop cans and stuff away but i i wanted to like make my my janitor a, a, amusing and so what i did was i i i, I wet my hair with mud at, from outside i went outside into the theater just and just poured like some water onto mud and just picked the mud up and just put it in my hair right <laughs> and the idea is that uh, and this was earlier on the day the idea is that i wanted dust to like come out of the hair right like when i walked onto the stage and um the, I was watching the play unfold from the from the sidelines, and I was I was lip syncing the words like as as my, and these guys were fifteen, you know, all these kids, and we nailed the place. They were nailing it after every scene. I was like, yes, they did it, perfect, perfect scene, perfect scene, perfect scene. And then it was my scene at the end, which was going to round round off the whole thing. I was so so nervous. Um, now, before I end the story, I also have to add some. Some more to it because the school that i went to was like a sports school right like sports was the main thing of the school and and i was the opposite of that i just wanted to play video games i just wanted to play magic i just wanted to, like i was like a nerd at the school you know uh and and i certainly didn't i was certainly in the on the hierarchy of popularity <laughs> of a school i was like rock bottom right at the at the very bottom um, just because I didn't fit into the sportsman stereotype that was expected. So this moment was like a very, this was like a very intense moment because this was either like, this was a Napoleon Dynamite moment, right? Where Napoleon either comes on and the whole school ridicules him and laughs him off stage or he pops off, right? And, uh, and suddenly flips the whole school. This was my Napoleon Dynamite moment. And I came onto that stage and I was expecting the whole school to laugh at me, right? Because, you know, when you're at the bottom of the hierarchy, that's what happens. You know, you just, you get used to it. And as I came onto that stage and as I like scratched my head, a huge puff of smoke came out. And for some reason, it must've just looked hilarious. And the whole <laughs> school just laughed with me. 
yeah. and not at me for like for the first time in, in my entire time at that at, at that school and it was in this moment that i realized like th i want to do this whatever this moment is where i have brought happiness to these people and we have connected in this way this is what i want like it was in that moment that i realized what i wanted in life like i didn't want to work in an office or whatever i needed to find a back door into some sort of entertainment whether it's music or theater or whatever or writing whatever it was but yeah i did a lot of theater that <laughs> is amazing. what a story, story. Yeah. i love that story that's fantastic <laughs> That was awesome. Brilliant. Mud yep. in the hair. Huh? Oh, my God. What a brilliant idea, man. By the way, there was a girl in, in, uh, in the audience who was the daughter of one of the teachers who, who I, I, I wrote this play to impress her. <laughs> it was one of my driving, because we were, we were friends. We, I sang in a, in a choir with her. Like There was a choir thing near the school. And we were friends in the choir, but I wanted to like push it, you know. I wanted to, sh I really wanted to woo her with my talent. <laughs> Not only was I going to write the play, but I was going to like be this janitor also. Didn't impress her. Didn't get a kiss. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing. Just friend zoned. Just try washing your hair instantly. First. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Maybe because you came down with a case of ticks after that. <laughs> no, it's so funny. I I I remember the night so clearly because it was such a pivotal mo pivotal moment in my life. I was outside like pumped with adrenaline and she actually came over to me uh from where the the crowd was and i thought this is it <laughs> sweet i'm about to get a kiss you know this is amazing like this is it i'm gonna i'm gonna get a girlfriend from now she just came over and said well done that was great and then we went back to her parents i want to go back uh... to in time when she came and said that, walked away, and I want to punch you and say, "Go, go!" Uh, I know, dude. Is, I know. I should, it's I not the movies, it, man. man. She's not gonna come. Just it's not. It doesn't work yeah, like that. You like... Got... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's God, fantastic. what a story! I am just, I am, I am fascinated right now. Then that was, and not to mention, um, what what theater can do, and what for the love for the arts can do, is it can make us really, really good storytellers, which you very clearly are. And there's a reason why I look down at we. So we do have a timer. We 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 you know we have to keep in mind and stay mindful of where we're at. I looked down and said three minutes, and then you told your story. And now it's at fifty seven minutes. Like like that's not. It's it, it was like so fast. It was so fast. Wow. And that story was so good. <laughs> that story was so good. So there's no way that this is possible. But is that experience on video anywhere <laughs> no oh, god no come on no nobody, no no that's <laughs> nobody i mean that? my dad might have a like a tape somewhere you know who knows uh, that was that was 90s you know this <laughs> oh, there's would no be... video evidence of that I'm uh, yeah it's so interesting to think of like you know all these things we did when we were young and how difficult it was to capture all these moments where now anything any kid does out there's 10 phones at least recording them yeah, exactly, with digital yeah. files that you know will probably be able to last forever and and yeah i mean maybe 20 years down the road we're gonna look at it and be like oh geez 4k really they thought that was I, good i know you know what i mean yeah. like <laughs> no it's it's so nuts <laughs> I, well, i'll tell you yeah, this so mad. if there's oh boy i got it so what i do sometimes on these podcasts when i'm editing is I like to supplement them a lot when the time calls for it, supplement it with additional footage or videos or pictures or whatever. And I've done it in the past. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we had Mumbo on and he was talking about a film that he had made. So I went and found snippets of it and had it uh, up on the screen as he was telling the story. It adds to it. Right. So naturally, but I don't do it for the sake of doing it. I do it when it makes sense. Oh boy, what I would give to have video of what he <laughs> just talked about. I want to see that. So I mean, if I'd it, love to see it too. Yeah, my God. That would be amazing. Would have been awesome. So I'm throwing down the gauntlet, people listening. Somebody please animate that. Oh. <laughs> like take take red because that because I don't you and I it, impulse and I were really quiet because we were captivated. Yeah. So that was a beautiful moment of just pure narration with let's just say, call it what it is. He's got an amazing voice. So that being like narrating the animation, this is this is an opportunity for you out there, animators. <laughs> Talking to you, Rusty. Yep. <laughs> oh, like, oh, calling out a specific yeah. animator. Oh man. No, uh, but you know, it's it's difficult to translate uh, theater energy to to Minecraft videos. It's certainly something that I've been learning over the years um, because 
the trouble is that the audience it's it's not like how do i explain this so when some you know when when people are consuming youtube content they can find any of your videos throughout the season right so they search hermacraft season 10 they get you know schizzle man episode four and maybe that's the first one that they watch if you go too heavy into theater and too heavy into lore a new viewer oh, comes in what makes sense? Like, it's like it's it's like watching a netflix series and starting at episode yep. season three episode five right like there is there is no way that th this new viewer can connect and yeah. so you either either one or two things happen this viewer thinks this is awesome i'm going to start at the beginning but I think that most viewers don't. And I simply say this because I think this is how we all consume media, right? Like there's so much available, an infinite amount of content available to watch on Netflix or whatever, that you, you're super picky. If you start watching something and within a few minutes you, it doesn't connect, you're out. Like that's it, you don't even give it a chance. It could be the best series ever, but because you don't connect in that moment, um, you move on. So doing theater stuff like this, and uh, which is why I've sort of, lent a little bit further away from doing super heavy theater lore stuff is because for new viewers it's very intimidating they they have no idea like what's going on yeah like the first episode of my season nine hermacraft series is a spaceship that's like docked at a at a, at a diner in space and the spaceship like un, it unhatches and like zooms into hyperspace it's freaking sweet it's <laughs> awesome but if you're brand new to rendog you're like what what is this Right. This this lore has been built up since season seven, right? So a new viewer is just like, well, I have no idea what this is. Um, so it's kind of difficult, you know. You have to you have to make uh, artistic sacrifices, I guess. I'd put it this way, to ensure that you can, because at the end of the day, we still need to pay bills, right? You can't just make art and and if it's not going to pay the bills, then <laughs> yeah, you can't keep doing it. So you have to find that balance. Um, Do you ever worry yeah, about so I've, that? Do you ever what, worry paying about paying the bills? No, the end of the, the, <laughs> end of the day. Um, you know what I mean? Like I, we have this conversation with a lot of artists. I'm gonna do it again. Um, where you know, it, there's always God, this, you're pretentious. There's always this concern <laughs> that that you know, five minutes of fame is gonna be over. And in our case, we've been lucky enough to have a decade of of what I would deem fame at this point, right? But you know, at the end of at the end, of, everything as Skiz likes to say this too. You know, everything comes to an end, right? Yeah. It's yep. just it's just the nature of the world, right? At at, uh, at some course. point in time, this this YouTube journey, this Hermitcraft journey, is going to end, uh, and it's a it's a it's a it's a legitimate fear <laughs> that I have, and I know I know uh, a lot of uh, fellow creators, artists have as well. Uh, how how do you where does your brain go when we start talking about the end of this era? What do you what do you think is well, next uh, for Ren? Well, I mean, nature nature tends toward entropy, so absolutely it all comes to an end. Uh, of this, there is no doubt, but that can be said for all things, including life, right? Um, I think that the way that I used to deal with this as a younger person was just ignore it, right? Ah, that's something that'll happen way down the line, who cares? We'll, we'll deal with it when we get there, which has very much been... Uh, my life up until now uh, you know being being an immigrant and and life being so uh, chaotic and fluctuating all the time it's very much been a oh we'll deal with it when it happens and then you know you deal with it really well and then you move on to the next thing to deal with but i think uh, i've been changing my mindset about this over the last few years as i've gotten a bit older and i was thinking about this today actually and i'm glad you brought it up because i wanted to talk about it with you guys today because uh I think this is a very interesting um, topic. And it's all about change is what we're talking about, right? And the inevitability of change. Change is coming no matter what for all of us. Yep. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, when I was at Minecon in Boston for that TV show, I was saying to the, the makeup artist, I said to her, I'm really worried about like what my eyes are going to look like. Can, can you, can you make, make me look good on camera? You know? <laughs> and she just looked at me and she said, you will never look better today you you'll never you'll never look better than you do today so just shut up <laughs> <laughs> and you know this is a very interesting thing that she said because it's true right like like we are you know uh 
it, it reminds me of, uh, of a band that I used to listen to when I was very young called Typo Negative. And there was a song called Everything Ends. Everything ends. <laughs> Is it? It was like, you know, it's super depressing and like death metal-y. But actually, it's very profound because it's true. But what I've come to realize is that nature itself functions in a state of constant change, yep. right? If we think about something simple like a flower, uh, you know, budding and blooming and then decaying, these are all states of change. And we all live in a state of change consistently. But for some reason, we try to uh, stop the change and live out of uh, sync with nature. So let me give you an example. The way that uh, I'm going to use my introduction for my videos as an example. For the last 10 years, I've done this introduction. Uh, Greetings, cyberdogs and citizens of the interbubs. This is Ren Diggity Dog coming at you with another <laughs> episode from the Hermitcraft server, right? Mm -hmm. I've done this intro for 10 years to try and crystallize reality and to dodge change. But what I'm really doing is going against the nature of all things when doing this. And I think that for me, especially moving forward as I get a little bit older, I'm going to lean into change and mm. join the river, right? The jump in the stream, let, it, let, let the nature of change take you and, and, and not try and capture like these moments, not try and like uh, keep everything the same all the time. It's uncomfortable. People hate change. And I think people hate change because they know what comes at the end of change, which is the end, right? Mm. That's what, it, that's what, it, that, that's what, that, that's the final step in, in, in change. But I think it's kind of weird and unnatural for us to uh, keep avoiding change or ignoring it or trying to capture it um, the way that we do. Trying to, trying to and, fight it. That, God, or fight it. Yeah, yeah. yeah people try to fight yep. it. They try to deny it. They try to win. It's why we see yeah. such an epidemic in Botox. And 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 I'm not and I'm not placing judgment here. But there's like you, some some people try some celebrity bound specifically. They try to fight change so drastically that the amount of procedures that they have done, they end up that you you fight change, you don't fit anymore. They look like something is characteristically wrong with them mm -hmm. because they've gotten so uh, obsessed with the idea of fighting change. There was, did you ever see mm -hmm. the show Scrubs? You ever seen Scrubs? One of my favorites. Such a great show. And there's a scene, I know we've talked about this on the podcast. I don't remember if we had a guest or not, but um, uh, Dr. Cox was addressing J.D. and Turk. So J.D. and Turk are the younger doctors, and Dr. Cox is the authority, if you will. And uh, J.D. and Turk, we just kept trying to fight the fact that they were tired all the time. They wanted to go out and have a drink after work, even though they just worked a 15 hour shift, they wanted to be able to go still party. Every time they tried to go party, one of them fell asleep or they didn't even make it out of the apartment because they're so <laughs> tired, but they just kept trying to fight and, and get and just <laughs> stay young and, you know, and fight the fact mm -hmm. that you're getting old. And Dr. Cox says to him, like he finally has a talk with him where he's like, you're, you're getting older and, and you can't fight it. So I suggest you just embrace it. Just mm -hmm. let it happen. He, he said, there's no, yep. you cannot fight the fact that you're getting older. The best thing to do is just let it happen. And that's what you're talking about. Yep. Stop trying to swim upstream and just sometimes you just got to go with the actual current yeah. and just, just embrace the change. I think I, I agree. Absolutely. With you. I think it's the best we way. We can learn so cope. much from it. Yeah. We can learn so much from it. I mean, for me personally, I, I you know, I'm adapting a lot or, or I'm, I'm, I'm going with the change a lot. Like I used to do a lot more high energy uh, delivery on my, in my videos that would, that would appeal more to like a younger audience, like an under 20 audience. But I'm like much more chill now as a person and a little bit older. And I kind of don't want to be hitting that audience too much anymore. Cause I think it's kind of weird <laughs> for uh, someone my age, like, uh, you know, going for, uh, you know, trying to entertain uh, younger people. So, but of course, because I've been doing that, it, that so, so for so long, doing it this way for so long, I'm so anti-changing the way that I deliver and the way that I make videos. You know, it's so difficult to change like uh, the way that I've been doing this because you have all this fear. Oh, if I change my videos, I'm going to lose all my view. Ch my channel dies and then YouTube's done. And then, you know, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then. <laughs> but at some point, you know, you have to be brave and you just have to say, well, you know, things are changing. I'm getting older. My audience is getting older. It is what it is. You know, yep. it's cool. 
there's loads of awesome young uh, um, artists coming up behind us that the young people can get behind. But there's also a huge audience that is our age and a little bit younger that are going to be behind us. And that's awesome, you know? Yeah. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think like uh, I'm doing my, uh, this season I've definitely started to shift away from sort of high energy content to, to more mature energy content. Um, oh, Sam, I'm saying content. Ugh. <laughs> just <infected me. laughs> this word is just it's been so infectious it, because it's yeah. it's what marketing agencies they, they use these words and would you every, rather use influencer like, uh, <laughs> oh no 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 no, no, no. <laughs> like here i've been here i've been thinking well at least i'm not saying influencer content creator does sound better yeah. than that but no you got me convinced on the artist thing but yeah you're absolutely right i mean yeah. um there's there's no finding the fact that we are getting older um and and our we're maturing in different ways i mean everything you just said was an extremely mature response to dealing with the inevitable right and that's yes. something that uh you know a decade ago i don't think i would have been comfortable uh hearing you know no <laughs> me neither <laughs> so so yeah it's 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 great food for thought and and something i think that anyone um and it's not not even you know, a content creator or artist position should uh, embrace. It's it's something humanity. You do should You're, embrace. I want to go back to the river metaphor. That yeah. is so. That's so apropos for what we're talking about because when you get into a river, if you start trying to swim upstream, a couple things are happening. You're miserable. One. Mm -hmm. And then also you're fixating on where it is that you think you're supposed to be, and you're trying to be over there. You're never there just be where you're at and if you just like succumb to the river and i'm not trying to be bleak about just let bad things happen i'm not saying that but if you just succumb to the river and let it take you then you're living in the now now you're actually there mm -hmm. for the ride mm -hmm. if you don't pay attention to the fact that you're actually on a ride and all you're focusing on is the end of the ride you're gonna miss the whole thing yep you totally just, just, totally just ride, just ride along man <laughs> i'll expand on that you know because uh i'll say it, it, it's it's also equally bad to jump out the river for a bit and stand on the side right yeah which yeah. is exactly what i was doing um I, and i'll go back to my my intro uh, as an example so I, I i started getting i started not using my intro and i started getting comments like oh ren you've changed you've changed you're not using the the, the intro anymore I, th this is terrible. You know, I don't want to watch this anymore. I want my old rain dog back. You know, you get all of those sort of mm -hmm. comments, right? But basically what, what these commenters are asking for you to do is to jump out of the river mm -hmm. and just stay the same because they're, they are uncomfortable with change. That's right. Right. That's right. But what I, if I, if you do that and you jump out the river, you miss out on all the cool stuff that, that happens down the road. I was saying to Skiz, uh, uh before this, uh, session, uh, impulse that I've started to learn, um, uh, premiere this year so i've set myself just to just to learn something new this year i wanted to edit season 10 in premiere after 10 years of using vegas and i just went in blind did a you know a few test runs before the season started but literally started editing episode zero and one having never used premiere before but that was me jumping back in the river of editing right i jumped out of the river when i installed vegas 10 years ago and i never bothered to jump back in yeah now a month down the line using Premiere. Premiere is amazing. It's, it's, I have been able to edit in ways that I w was never able to before. And I've been able wow. to produce art in a way that it was never possible before. And that's because I jumped in the river again, you know, so and to I'm speak. I'm sure it was uncomfortable um, at first, right? Like, this is amazing. You, you, weren't, you weren't editing as fast and, and you had to learn as yeah. you went. And, uh, and, oh, it was and, horrible. And there's yeah. friction. It was horrible. There's the, friction. The water was cold. The current was jarring. Like, yeah. you had to, when you jump back in, you had to reacclimate yeah. to the motion yep. and to the temperature. But next thing you know, you're starting to get used to the water. You're going the same speed as the river. And like, now you're discovering new things that you didn't know were possible. Absolutely. This is me. Absolutely. This is a neat metaphor. I, you, I, I just got chills. Me too. And I'm still getting yeah. over shingles. So chills really hurt. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't be laughing about that, but I am. <laughs> and, wow. you know, ironically, it does in a, in a strange way loop all the way back to what I was originally saying about immigration and warning young people about immigration. Um, in the same vein, if you are positive about immigrating and you want to do it, do it that way. Jump in the river. Go oh, full on. Um, you know, it, like immigration is the ultimate change. It is, it is a river that will never stop changing. You know, it's, it's going to take you in, in, in a much more chaotic uh, path than just staying in your country or in your town or whatever. 
it's going to be an intense rapid of a river. <laughs> but if you're up for it, it's going to be amazing, you know? Wow. And just wow. and jump straight in. Blowing minds, man. I, I, Blowing minds. Yeah. <laughs> so profound. No, dude. but, it's, but it, I, it's happening. I'm doing a lot of my own self-reflection. Yeah. And I got to tell you, I am, it could be argued, well, I'm trying to be in the river and stand on the side at the same time, <laughs> which is causes a lot of anxiety, yeah. right? So if I I think that's what most of us do. I think so too. But I, and I think yeah. if I wasn't so, and I'm just being vulnerable here, if I wasn't so deathly afraid of losing the ability to provide for my family, I would, I would quit my job and I would jump in the river and just, just mm -hmm. pursue the, the, the YouTube thing all the way through. I can't pursue it to the mm -hmm. level I'd like to, because I still work full time in my career. But if I wasn't so deathly afraid, I mean, if you want to get super technical, this would be the third layer of Maslow's Pyramid, love and belonging. I, my role in the love and belonging is being a father, a husband, a provider. It's my That is my everything. And I'm so deathly mm -hmm. afraid of one day not being able to provide that, that I'm just, I, I, I can't jump in. I just, I'm not, I haven't jumped in the river. I just can't do it. Maybe I will, maybe I will, but I'm just right now, mm -hmm. I'm so like, this is making me realize what ex exactly what I'm doing and the turmoil I feel is because I'm trying to have a foot on the sideline yeah. and a foot in the river. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. it's fun. Doesn't match up. Yeah. Well, Ren, I got to tell you, man, uh, wow. this has been just a fantastic sit down with you. Yeah. Uh, I could have never imagined that we would blink and I would look over and it's over an hour long. Yeah. Like and that just says uh, wonders <sighs> to how great of a storyteller you are and how great of a person you are and, and uh, just how much I enjoyed really getting to know you even more. Uh, you know, we've had, we've had a lot of time together since, since season four when you joined, but uh, nothing this significant. So this has been a pure pleasure on my end for you to, uh, to spend your time with us today on the show and uh yeah thank you so much we we really do appreciate it i feel the same way you know i was thinking today uh, while i was having a walk that you uh i mean and skiz i guess because i've also known you for a long time but not as directly as impulse you impulse you've been uh my longest standing colleague of all time wow like i've worked with you longer than i've worked with with anybody yet wow. Uh, this is the first time after all these years that we've managed to to get a little bit closer to each other this way. So, right. you know, really, really, really cool. Yeah, and, yeah um, it really has been. Yeah, Skiz, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm like a quiet Skiz fanboy. I don't want to say anything, though, because <laughs> your your head is already massive. But like, I absolutely <laughs> love you. And, um, you know, to I, I know we, we didn't even get to talk about Tool and stuff, but I know we have so much in common. I, all three of us have, I think, had quite similar... Um, music could, tastes and cultures we could literally we, do a whole podcast about 90s yeah. <laughs> 90s music yeah. together and i think it'd be fantastic yep. exactly <laughs> i think we exactly so i think we are kindred spirits in this way and and i, I was just when you guys invited me on i was just so incredibly uh, excited to get to know you both more because i think that i i feel a, a a connection with you guys that's outside of uh youtube and, yeah, and all of that i agree know? i'm looking sometimes forward. you can just spot the, you can spot the deftones people across the room <laughs> yeah. like, ah. yeah. well, those ones you know what's also interesting <laughs> i know we got to wrap this up but i think that my moment with ren that i realized i very very much like this cat um as as an artist as a as, as a fellow artist uh was the live series and it wasn't just being able to like do these scenes with you it was specifically <laughs> <laughs> it was at the end of that first series where, cause you were King Ren and we were about to go stage an attack. <clears throat> and just as we were about to go, you said, gentlemen, you know, gather around, gather around. I'm like, Oh, I'm in. He's going to do a whole bit. He's probably trying to channel William Wallace or something. He's going to do a whole bit and I'm in for it. So I'm like, I'm going to play my part. And they're all like <laughs> jacking around. They start shooting arrows. I'm like, guys, he's trying to, and you kept trying to do this speech, but like they weren't catching on. And then finally red goes, guys, I'm trying to make a speech here. <laughs> dude, it was so funny, dude. And I realized, he I wants to, yeah, he wants to commit, but nobody is like, they're all like, so they like, want to get in the uh. war. But in that moment, I remember thinking, like, I, I hope I have a lot more collaboration with this guy because we are on a similar energy, uh, a similar frequency, if you will. And and I think that you and I very much work well together. But oddly, I am most looking forward to you and I and getting into some sort of grinding thing where we're not really making content or recording some grind we're doing. And I could just get in a group with you and let's just talk tool. Let's just tell you like we can do it. <laughs> not everybody is, is huge music fans, but, but we are, and, and this could be a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward to just a very human engagement that inevitably is in our future. I, I got so many stories for you guys. I worked in the music business for a while. I met 
quite a few bands. Uh, I would love to tell you all the stories. So. No, I'm here for it. I'm here for it, man. Oh, right. yes. Well, we will let you oh, go. Yes. I know it's starting to uh, get later in the day for you. And uh, yeah, thanks again for your time. This was an absolute pleasure. The super, super, so. super guest today. Yeah. And this, maybe we'll do the music podcast uh, uh, some other time down the road. We'll see. Sweet. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> thank you again. And uh, we'll see. Uh, so I don't know which camera to look at uh, anymore. Right, we'll just we'll stay right here because I don't even know. We'll see. Bye, guys. Bye. You're the best. See you guys. Bye, guys.